Hello, and welcome to our weekly live stream. Uh, my name is Peter Schneider. Uh, I'm from Gotham Sound. Uh, today's live stream is about virtual reality sound, production sound for virtual reality. And I am here uh, with Laura Cunningham to my left, and to her left is Jose Frias. Um, so why don't we start with Laura? Laura, tell us about yourself. How did you, how did you come to be here? What, what uh, sort of sound do you do? Uh, well, I'm a production sound mixer, so um, I normally work on documentary-style projects. Um, and I also have a degree in acoustics, so the production sound and the acoustics VR sound is kind of a perfect merging of those two things. We'll get back to that in a second. Jose, <laughs> tell us about yourself. Um, I'm also a production sound mixer. Uh, also work mostly uh, unscripted type things, so documentary-style, run, EMG, that type of thing. Um, I got my start in virtual reality through Laura Cunningham, who hired me as an A2 for a VR shoot that we did maybe like two years ago or something like that. Uh huh. So, what? When was the first VR shoot that you guys did? Like, when was the first time where you were like, "This is different"? Um, what was the project we worked on? That was just about two years ago, was it? Uh, so yeah, for that particular project. Um, I mean, we signed NDA, so I don't think we can talk much in detail about it, but it was uh, essentially multi multiple uh, VR pr uh, uh, setups and a basketball game for a D-League team, mm -hmm. um, and essentially we're just doing ambient sound. We weren't really necessarily miking any players. We did get a um, an audio track for, for the referee or something like that. I, I for the announcer. Yeah, 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 that yeah, was our only. That, that, that um, about two years ago. <coughs> yeah, yeah, so about two years ago, we did that job together. Yeah, um, like two and a half years ago, I think, was my first. And I was just, we were recording 360 video at a concert. Let, let's, let's back up one minute. Um, sure. 360 video, VR, sure. like what, what, what are these? How, how are these different from other um, mediums? Well, so VR 360 video is using multiple cameras, um, whether it's GoPros or DSLRs or something else at the moment, but it's multiple cameras in an array so that you're getting a full 360 perspective once you stitch the image from each individual camera together. So oh. it's a one perspective from one central location looking in every direction. And how is it different from, say, 3D filming? I think the key difference would be that 3D filmmaking is still done mostly from a third person perspective. Um, you're uh, someone witnessing an event that is happening outside uh, of your control, whereas a virtual reality in 360 is a first person perspective where you're literally placed right in the middle of the action or whatever is happening around you. Um, there's obviously uh, similarities in terms of, you know, there's things coming out uh, in 3D particularly, there's things coming out at you and some way to become interactive, but it's still sort of kind of an illusion. Uh, whereas uh, 360 in VR, you have a little bit more control. It's like, you know what, I want to turn this way and see what's happening in this direction, you know, so things like that. You've hit on, on something interesting. How, how does one experience 360 or VR as a viewer? Well, there's multiple platforms right now for mm -hmm. experiencing it, um, but the best way is through a VR headset, like the Oculus, Gear VR. Uh, so you're putting on a headset, and as you move around, like left, right, up, down, you actually are tracking with the video. So the video um, is reacting to your movements. So when you look up, you actually see the ceiling. When you look down, you actually see the floor. So you're present inside of it, and it rea reacts to your movements. Uh huh. So it, it requires. So unlike um, watching a movie, you, you know, where you just go to the theater or see it on TV, you need sort of specialized equipment to Correct. experience this. And what about the sound for that? How how does one experience the sound? Uh, typically binaural. Uh, you're using uh, heterolator transfers, transfer functions to sort of kind of play out the space and to to track or two-channel audio. Um, and ideally, the, the situation would be that the head tracking 
uh, the head motion tracking that the VR headset is doing will pass off the information to the audio side of things so that it also sort of kind of ch changes the perspective of sound as you pivot your head this way or that way or up and down. Uh -huh. um, I did want to add that even though uh, uh, specialized equipment is sort of kind of the best way to consume the content, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is a requirement. Uh, it's becoming fairly accessible today with uh, the uh, integration of YouTube and Facebook 360 videos where essentially right from your browser you can click and drag um, or use the arrow keys on your keyboard to sort of kind of navigate the world. Uh, you can sort of kind of get some audio out of it but it's still not to the point where you get the really finessed uh, audio experience where you know you're getting the full uh, change of perspective as you pivot around. And is that because there's hardware in the uh, sort of goggles, is that the right word for it? Goggles? Sure. Headset. Headset, Headset yeah. um, that sort of can really track your Correct. the position of your head in, in rotational space? Uh, the limitation on, on those platforms is mostly uh, uh, needing to advance further. Uh, I mean, they're capitalizing on that now. Facebook uh, originally bought Oculus, uh, and then they just recently bought Two Big Ears. So I, th I feel like they're slowly progressing into uh, building it into their platform so that it is still readily available, um, but it will have all this, uh, you know, this l higher level of uh, audio interaction um, as you, you know, drag around the world. Um, and then, you know, there's also other devices like Gear VR that was mentioned where you can load it up on your phone and place it on this accessory and then that would sort of kind of interact with that as well. So th th there'll be also third-party accessories that, that would allow the technology to be readily available at, at consumers' uh, you know, grasp. Huh. So then my question is, and uh, Laura, this one is for you, um, how does recording sound for VR differ from recording sound for, say, regular episodic or film? Um, so there's multiple ways we record sound for VR that's different, um, and one is the microphone that's right in front of us using an ambisonic microphone. Um, and this microphone records in 360 just in the way, in the same sort of concept that the camera records in 360. So there's ambisonic microphones. Um, and we also use, well, it's similar to episodic or other types of recording in that you can also stash mics mm -hmm. um, in the space. Uh, and like if something's happening over there in that corner and you put a microphone over there to capture that in post, they can then locate that so it spatially corresponds to the video. So we can stash mics um, and then also similar to traditional as we wire actors or wire characters as well. Uh, uh, one thing that I'm curious about is, um, you know, in a traditional film there's um, multiple cameras and multiple frames, but there's also multiple places that are not in frame. Mm -hmm. So how do you guys deal with um, this idea that there's, that everything is in frame? Everything around, there, the camera is everything. How, how do you guys deal with this? Like, where do you guys go? We hide. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Usually, usually you have to sort of kind of move out of the way or out of the frame. Uh, the sort well, of like the frame is everything. I, right? I understand, but yeah. uh, <laughs> you can hide in plain sight. Like you know, if, uh -huh. if there is a table, you can sort of kind of either duck there or if like there's yeah. a wall. So uh, one one thing that I always hear from camera technicians is. Uh, uh, 360 camera technicians is if you see the camera, the camera sees you. So that's sort of kind of the rule of thumb that you right. utilize. It used to be if you see the lens, the, then the lens could correct. see you. Correct. So, no, so no. if you see the camera rig, the camera, yeah. rig, uh, camera rig sees you. Wow. Um, and and I, I think uh, how it differs for, from traditional production style uh, shooting is that you're also thinking of how scenes are played in a different manner. You're also thinking how you uh, art or, or decorate the set in a different manner, how you place different elements in different manner, because in 2D, you're usually working with whatever you have in one frame. In 360, you're working all around. And ideally, I think as a rule of thumb, is that you want something happening always or most of the time around you so that the consumer can sort of kind of pivot around and explore different things, huh. not necessarily focus just on one single thing. And so while it's true that the cameras do see everything, mm -hmm. um, you can also hide stuff. Um, like since each camera overlaps the lens, uh -huh. so the image overlaps between cameras. So sometimes you can hide things in those overlaps. 
Interesting. Yeah. Um, because the software that stitches it together will remove it. Mm -hmm. It'll find so, some correct. point that doesn't yeah. exist. Got um, it. And also, uh, what was the other thing? Um, if a lot of times um, the camera department, they have to paint out certain things, like the camera's on a stand. Yeah. So camera department is painting out the stand or the tripod that they're using. Uh -huh. So a lot of times we can hide mics where camera equipment is because they're painting out those stands, they're painting out things anyways, and they can also paint out our microphones sometimes. Let, let's talk about that for a second. So is it universally true then that the, a mic like this or this mic would go wherever the camera is, that this mic represents the camera perspective? Um, ideally, yeah. uh -huh. I would say so. Ideally, because uh, what you would do with this in post production, which we can talk a, lo a little bit later, is that you would sort of place this right at camera perspective, and then uh, whatever tools you're utilizing would decode the uh, ambisonic format audio into a binaural that can use the head motion tracking to sort of kind of play out the audio. And along those lines, um, how much how much decision making takes place in production as opposed to post production? Like, what is your mix, for example, during a VR shoot? Is there a mix during a VR shoot, or are you strictly tracking? Mostly, I would say it's tracking mm -hmm. that you want you're wanting to mic up as many individual sources as possible. Um, and then also having separately, say, like your ambisonic mic. Or if you can't put an ambisonic mic on camera, maybe you can put a mono mic on camera. Uh -huh. um, so at least that's a mono source, but it's still from camera perspective. Interesting. And I think it's worth talking, too, that we're not just talking about films necessarily, right? There's a whole bunch of different media that are moving in this direction and using that equipment. Yep. Like uh, video games? For sure. And and that like uh, 360 walkthroughs and Correct. all kinds of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. As uh, a matter of fact, in my opinion, mm -hmm. I'd say that uh, the medium plays itself best when the content is meant to sort of kind of give you an experiential uh, thing, like you're supposed to experience something. Uh, in terms of scripted uh, things, it's a little bit hard to play in the medium, in my opinion, because typically, uh, you're having to focus on something. You know, you're presenting one single frame and this frame gives you the information you need to sort of kind of go along with the story. And 360 or VR, you're, it's more about exploration. You're sort of kind of navigating this world and, you know, if you pivot around and something is happening over here and you miss it, then you miss the story, which is sort of kind of why, you know, it sometimes doesn't always play out very well for scripted situations. Not saying that it's impossible. Some people have done it really, really smartly. Um, but I feel that the content that you see predominantly uh, uh, excelling in this medium is that kind of stuff, like walkthroughs or, or you know, sort of kind of experiencing Broadway mm -hmm. on, on, on 360 from uh, stage perspective and I things saw, like that. I saw um, a very, very powerful um, pro-choice um, VR piece sure. at the Tribeca Film Festival where you were in the car um, as a uh, to young women drive up to um, a clinic yeah. and um, you're in the car with them. And that seems to be a theme with some of the VR stuff I've seen. I guess it's just a natural place to put a 360 camera because you can look all around the car. Yeah. Um, but you're in the car as protesters, you know, anti-abortion protesters come up to you and lean into the car and sort of, um, you know, harass um, the, wow. the young women. It's very, very powerful and it, um, you know, I guess it's now a cliche to use the term empathy, but it really does give, uh, provide you as the viewer with a kind of empathy that I don't think you would in a traditional medium. You're sort of there with them and you're, because there's a certain degree of free will I find, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's incredibly powerful, you know, where you can sort of like choose to look at the pro protester, choose to look at the woman that she's talking to that's contemplating going to the clinic and um, yeah, I mean, it's it's very very. I found it very moving. For sure. Um, yeah. Rather than being an outside observer, you're yeah. actually experiencing it like you were present in yeah, the narrative. Yeah. Like the natural instinct would be to like stand up and you know get get the guy to go away. I mean, it's it's yeah, it's very it's very powerful. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's something that I'm I'm excited about. 
It's something that um, I'm excited about because it, I think, is part of the reason why 3D never took off the way it did. Sure. 3D has all of, in, in my opinion, um, mm -hmm. you know, all of the inconvenience of the, of the extra gear, like the glasses and mm -hmm. stuff, but none of the extra empathy. And, and I think VR has this amazing potential to, to show you a unique perspective. I mean, I, I, I come to it from a philosophical perspective. I agree with you, and I think 3D fails because of that reason. It's trying to absorb you and trying to make you part of something, whereas it's still, there's still that dichotomy it's that still you're the still... Wall. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where it's sort of kind of, I don't think it, do, it doesn't play out as well as this medium where the consumer is fully aware that, you know, they're going into this experience to, to be the person experiencing it, not to observe it from like a far away. It's like, I want to be a part of this. Yeah. Right. And well, we have been distinguishing between 3D versus VR, but you can actually do 3D yeah. in VR. Uh -huh. So you can have a stereo VR So how many VR cameras rig. is that, like that kind of a rig? Um, I've worked with one that had 14, but you can do it with eight, so. 8 to 14 cameras. Wow, yeah. that's a lot of data. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so let's then, before um, the t before everybody goes crazy, let's bring it back to audio. Yeah, uh, let the camera people have data. We could talk philosophy <laughs> all day. But um, for us, for you guys, the audio, it sounds like, is not too different than a traditional shoot. Um, but let's talk about different microphones. So um, you. This is your mic? Who's Correct. Jose? It's mine, but she also owns one. Yeah, uh -huh, we okay. both love this mic. <laughs> so why, so tell me, and let's, first of all, what mic is this? This is the Soundfield SPS 200. And t tell me about your love for this mic. <laughs> you can start. You, yeah. <laughs> she essentially uh, uh, convinced me as to the greatness of this mic, so she can start. Um, so this microphone is great. Um, so the concept behind Ambisonic is, um, as opposed to, say, a 5.1 mic, um, this is not one-to-one. -one. So like with 5.1, you have one capsule per speaker that you ultimately want to play that out of. Mm -hmm. Like same with stereo, one-to-one, -one, two mics, two speakers. But with Ambisonic, you have four capsules, um, but it isn't a one-to-one -one relationship. It's recording a full sound field around the microphone. So these capsules don't they don't correspond to a particular spot. They're actually just taking information for a full sound field so that you can then decode that in your computer with software and you can recreate a full sound field. So it's directional information, spatial information. Um, so that's why I love this microphone is it's so flexible in post and you get a full picture of what you're listening to. As opposed to, like, if I got um, two MS mics back to back, that still only gives me, you know, a kind of donut shaped perspective, right? Yeah, or so this will give you vertical information as right. well as your, like, sort of horizontal so when axis. I'm looking at my goggles and I, I tilt right. my head up, I, that the sound, this has captured enough audio information mm -hmm. to right. give me that perspective. Yeah. yeah. This is a, a sort of kind of picking off, uh, uh, writing off of the comment about MS, is that MS, you still have to decode that information to actually get a proper surround setup. Um, but like she said, there's no height information. This is a first order ambisonic, so you'll get width, depth, and height. Um, and it records four discrete tracks, and then in post-production, you can lay those tracks, pull up a plugin, and then you know just let it know what sort of output you want. It could be mono, it could be stereo, it could be surround, 5.1, 6.0, 7.0, 7.1, .1, et cetera. So that's if you're going to a traditional sort of linear medium. Correct. Um, and we'll show that. Um, but for VR sound, there is a whole other um, sort of algorithm that happens that tracks head movement and dynamically can flip the sound around. Is that, is that how that works? How, how does that work? <laughs> Turn that into a question. Yeah, that's fine. Um, in post-production, there is a different kinds of tools that you're utilizing to, that, that you could utilize to sort of kind of uh, achieve what you're saying. Uh, off the top of my head, I can think of uh, two big ears or now Facebook 360's uh, spatial workstation. Uh, there's sound particles uh, and there's VVSonics. And did I hear the two big ears is now 
free, is that? It is, correct. So it used to cost money. So and then Facebook purchased two big years and now they've essentially released it to the world. I think it's part of their initiative to sort of kind of uh, expand this platform and their particular platform. It'll have more content producers being able to create amazing content with great audio and then they'll be able to utilize it for their uh, uh, 360 platform. Um, to go back to the quest original question is that you would take the four discrete channels and you would place it into your Pro Tools session if you're using two big ears uh, or sound particles or, or Unity, for example, and there is a already third-party uh, uh, libraries that you can load up to, to Unity or with two big ears. You can essentially just load the track and, and it will spit out a multi-track uh, audio file and then it will also spit out like a a program file that you load up to whatever application you're building, either for Oculus or whatever the case may be, and that itself is, it's really the, the program itself that tells the headset to sort of kind of, okay, this is where you're panning, and then, you know, this is how you're going to decode that audio. Uh -huh. And it does that on the fly. Correct. Got it. Um, awesome. And then on set, though, it's, you're just listening to make sure that it's getting, um, you set all the gains the same for each capsule, right? And how do you monitor on set? Um, well, some recorders actually have a decoder for your headphones. Cool. Uh, some do not. Uh, so if you're using a recorder that doesn't, I mean, you just monitor each track to make sure nothing's peaking and everything's sounding all right, but you're not going to get a decoded signal. Um, so ideally, you have a recorder that can decode it and you can listen to it. Um, but if you don't, it's fine. You know, you can hear, listen to it after the fact and post the and image. And just a, a stupid question: Is there like a zero degree point on this mic? Um, yeah. So each one of these microphones has a front. Um, uh -huh. So on the sound field, it's the logo is uh -huh. your front. Uh -huh. um, so you know which way it's pointing in relation to the camera or the world around you. Got it. And, and we should say also, there's other kinds of of um, so the generic term for this is ambisonic, is that mm -hmm. true? Or a tetra tetrahedral microphone. Tetrahedral, mm -hmm. that yeah. sounds cool too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> tetrahedral, f tetra for four, so four capsules. And, but, and like, uh, like I remember going to AES in, God, it had to be like 94, like, you know, and there was this sort of uh, s small, relatively small company, Core Sound, that would always yeah. have yeah. mics that looked a little like this. Yeah. That's another example? Correct. The tetra mic from Core Sound is oh. another uh, tetrahedral or ambisonic microphone. Uh, there is also the Brahma mic. Huh. Soundfield itself has a whole range of them. Uh, this is the SPS 200. Their flagship one for location recording is actually the ST450, which it looks more like a large condenser diaphragm microphone, mm -hmm. uh, or a large diaphragm condenser microphone. Sure. But then it also comes with an output box that takes the A format, converts it to B format, and then that's what you record, and right, then... Wait, uh, hang on one second. Sure. A format, B format, what... Uh, what we can talk about that in a second. Essentially, uh, A format refers to recording each individual capsule's audio just as is. Uh -huh. B format is actually the four-track layout that has all that uh, width, depth, and height information. Huh. Um, so you're taking this, you know, adding and subtracting one channel to each other, and essentially you get four tracks that have this uh, uh, width, depth, and height information. And which format can you um, upload to YouTube or, or Facebook? Uh, for the most part, you would use B format. B format. It's mm -hmm. sort of kind of the standard uh, across many platforms. So let's, let's can we, we should look at and see what that's like, what, like how the signals come in, and then like, you know, how we go from A to B format. Could, could we do that? Sure. Um, so we have the mic uh, here. And it's plugged into our trusty Fireface 800. Um, it is indeed. And, uh, and take it away. Sure. So on the laptop, I have a Reaper uh, loaded, which is a, a DAW, uh, similar to Pro Tools. And in there, I have a four-channel track. And each of the individual capsules on the tetrahedral microphone are going to one of these tracks. And I've loaded a plug into this uh, to this track, which is a free sound field surround zone two. And that uh, is from the company that makes the microphone. Correct. This is a plug in that Soundfield or TSL Products, who's a parent company, uh, provides to use with uh, all their products. And and this one will allow you to select the input of your microphone. So in this particular case, we're working with an A format microphone. 
uh, if you're working with the SC450 or other microphones that spit out uh, a B format, you can choose that instead. Uh, and essentially, each of these capsules has its own independent channel. Um, and you can output to whatever uh, output format you like. It could be mono, stereo, surround sound, or B format if mm -hmm. you want to use other things. Mm -hmm. Oh, and just to mention, this one's for the sound field mic, but each one of these microphones does have their own free software to go with it. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so the idea is, I mean, you could probably use this with any of the microphones, but to get the best image, you should probably use the one that your microphone manufacturer has custom built for their microphone. Correct. Got it. Yeah. I mean, every microphone is designed with their own specification, so whatever software they design is probably in tune better with their microphone. So. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, it's all the same math, but right. each one is sort of specially tuned. Correct. So with this particular plugin, and you'll kind of get the same thing uh, with any other plugin is uh, what makes Ambisonic spe special to my eyes and I'm sure Laura would agree with me is the fact that in post-production you can alter the sound image uh, because you're you're working with a sound field so right now I'm spitting out stereo so that means that you can either put it on headphones or listen through speakers mm -hmm. and the front mic of the position is outlined by that little arrow. This is front facing, I'm looking forward. Which corresponds to the logo Correct. on the microphone. Correct. Which is right there. So um, if we're sort of kind of looking at this image and correlating the microphone, then you know Peter would be towards the back right, Laura will probably be directly behind, and I'm more towards the back left of the microphone. I can drag this arrow and flip it around so now, uh -huh. Laura is directly in front, you're to the left of the microphone and I'm to the right of the microphone. So I can rotate the image uh, 360 degrees. I can also rotate the image up and down in terms of height. So I can make the image, instead of front facing, I can make it so that it's up facing, so it would sound like it's above me, or I can make it so that it's downward facing, so that it sounds like it's coming from below me. Um, I can alter the width of the stereo image, and you can also alter the width of surround images as well, but I'm showing you the stereo version of this. Mm -hmm. So I can make it wider or narrower, hmm. so this would be mono. And on top of that, I can also change the pattern of the output. So right now I'm working with cardioids, but I can make it omnis, hmm. or I can change it to, binor uh, excuse me, to bidirectional and anything in between that. Wow. So, so this has this mic has lots of applications absolutely. beyond VR. Ambisonic, it's older than most people actually realize. I think it was developed in the 70s. Huh. Um, it you know kind of died down a little bit, but I think with the resurgence of virtual reality in 360, it's starting to become more popular as a format, and that's why you see more and more uh, manufacturers jumping on it. Sure, and I imagine uh, the DSP has gotten so much faster, and you know the ability to process sure. this in real time is absolutely. Gotten so much I mean, faster. previously you'd had to have like output boxes or boards or you know rack mount devices to sort of kind of do all this processing for you. Sure. Now it's loaded up into a plug-in in your favorite DAW right. Pro Couple Tools. Couple megabytes do, large yeah. and off exactly. Go. Yeah, amazing. I don't know if you want to add anything to this. Uh, I feel like you covered it. Yeah, it's just yeah. unbelievably flexible. Absolutely. Yeah. I know Laura does this too. I do as well is that every time I travel to a new location, I like to bring the mic with me and just record ambiences just because, you know, for a personal library, not necessarily to sell or anything like that, but I like recording, uh, you know, I recently came back from Panama. I did some recordings there uh, uh, in California, et cetera. So it's, it's fun. I have a, um, just a, a question that's totally a slight tangent, but, you know, if, if I'm recording music, um, you know, I want to get the band in front and I want to get some audience behind. Mm -hmm. Can I get sort of two stereo pairs out of this simultaneously or, or do two passes so that I can... Sure. Uh, I, I mean, it, it seems like I'd be able to have a mix of both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because all of the sonic information is captured 360 degrees. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Yeah. So huh. to do that, I would probably load up two tracks, the yeah. same thing, and then pull one of the plugins doing the front facing thing and do, do the other plugin doing the back facing thing. Well, I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, this should explain why we're both really big fans of the Ambisonic platform. It's yeah. strictly all about flexibility um, and potential. 
because you know maybe tomorrow the big uh, surround format will be 10.2, which you know it's sort of kind of thing, and then you know it's easily done via this plugin, you know, be able to decode to whatever format becomes a standard tomorrow. Um, we should uh, loop around and to get to some questions. Sure, um, let's do it. So Adam Drakenwolf says hello, hello. <laughs> um, this is cool. Um, how fast will VR reach mainstream acceptance? Well, you know, I have my own personal theories about that, but I do think um, the, the hardware seems to me to be the issue. So as soon as the hardware gets mainstream, then, um, you know, I think, right? I mean, what I do you guys think? it's all think? about accessibility. As yeah, soon as right. it becomes so easily accessible, which, you know, it's starting to get there, it's going to be I mean, everywhere. Samsung was, or Verizon was giving away the their version of the headset with the phone, right? Oh, yeah. Sound, yeah, Samsung yeah, like yeah, Gear like, VR, yeah. if you buy the phone, you get the headset yeah. free. free. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so it's 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 coming. Um, uh, thanks for broadcasting. You're welcome. What recorders do process the sound so you can listen to B format? Or? So the 788 does the mm -hmm. sound devices. Um, I believe the 744 does as well. I could okay. be mistaken there. There is a Nagra 6. I remember the Diva, like the like the Diva, um, the original Diva did. I thought, but anyways, I don't it's know. It's possible. If the new I think it. Might have actually. Yeah. That sounds right. Um, and then there's another recorder, and I may be butchering the name Aida Formix. Yes, which I don't know if that exists. Still. Uh, I think I think it still does. It's just you know in this side of the world it's a little harder to get, but Got I know it. in Europe mm -hmm. a couple of mixers who do use it. That also has a decoder. Nice. And as a matter of fact, both the Nagra and the Aida have an A format decoder, so you could be working with this microphone and it would decode it to stereo from that format. And so what, what's the difference between an A format decoder and a B format decoder? A format, B, B format decoder simply strips away uh, 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 the, the uh, height information, so you're sort of kind of sticking with, and it's a fixed stereo image based on the front of the, uh, the microphone. Got it. Uh, a format converts it to B format and then does that. Um, and is it like monitoring MS where you might just want to monitor, have that decoder in your headphone circuit and record the raw um, capsules to, to tape, is that how you, to disk, is that how you do it? Yeah, I'll just monitor, I'll just use it to monitor uh -huh. and then yeah, record all my separate raw signal A format. Got it. Cool. Um, and so that's, so that's it, so if you were, um, like if you were hired to do sound on a VR shoot, um, you would put the mic, I mean, I'm way oversimplifying it, but partially so that I un see if I understand it. Um, the mic goes kind of where the camera is. Mm -hmm. um, and do you, what do you give to your client? Like, what's your deliverable? Do you run it through that plugin, or do you assume they're sophisticated enough to deal with just the raw tracks? Or you like to do post? Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends who you're working with. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's always really important to talk to post, um, because if they can't, or don't want to deal with the ambisonic microphone, I mean, that's a conversation you want to have beforehand so you don't deliver something that they don't know what they're dealing with. Um, but yeah, so I would deliver the A format um, as well as any other mics, any other point sources. Um, and I also draw a diagram or take pictures or both wow. so they can see, okay, the front of the microphone was you know, aligned with camera number one so that they can sync it with the visual and then if, you know, if there's other point sources, okay, I hit a mic over here and over here and over here, so they have a full diagram that they can work with. Uh, Interesting, and, and your description of that led to another question which I have, which is with 14 cameras, I know you don't have 14 slates, but how do you, like, how do you deal with sync with that stuff? And well, the, the idea of syncing the cameras you know, is a separate question. I mean like sync the cameras to the audio. So cameras have their own syncing mechanism. Uh, there's a couple ways you can do it. Uh, popular ones is take an umbrella, do a flash, and the flash uh, goes all over the cameras. A uh, different way is shake the camera. So if you do like a little shake and pose, they can take that motion and sort of kind of use that as a syncing point. Um, and then once the cameras are all synced, you know, you have a syncing marker for cameras and you can do a syncing marker for camera and audio and you can do a regular slate with just one camera. 
and I mean, ideally, you know, ha something uh -huh. with time code, or you know, what, or Got they can it. do waveform matching too, sure. um, to sort of kind of uh, do the syncing between audio and video. And is is this uh, part of why people were excited about um, time code systems sync back? Is this I was. <laughs> All right. So, uh, and we should uh, loop back. SyncBack um, is a uh, small device that fits on the back of the GoPro camera. Yep. Um, you know, sort of just slides in place um, and provides time code, time coded media t for the GoPro. Correct. All of the GoPros that might be in a rig, right? And it does it wirelessly, which is really the interesting part. So, um, which would be the the audio recorder's time code. Correct. So the time code system works off of a network time code solution. So you can have a master and it transmits wirelessly to uh, uh, the receivers, if you will. And so the sync backs can work as a receiver for each of the GoPro so they can all have the exact same time code, which is actually quite revolutionary in my opinion because before then there was no time code solution for GoPro. It's literally strictly based on waveform matching or you do a visual reference like a slate. Um, so that's why I was personally excited about the SyncBacks as a solution for 360 shoots because you can do time code uh, syncing because, you know, flashes sometimes don't get caught by like the, uh, the, the Nadir cameras sure. or, you know, if you're shaking, one of them may have shaken too much or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like there's always issue, but I always feel that time code is sort of kind of like the fail-proof way, especially with the network solutions where, uh, absolutely. you know, you can see in the network all the little devices in the network and say, oh, they're all running the same time code, okay, we're good, let's roll. So I, th I thought that was an interesting solution. It still hasn't been applied as far as I can tell, um, but I think it's sort of kind of the step, in, uh, the right step forward. Hmm. And to be clear, we don't need a, a computer. You don't, you, you don't have to have a computer on location, right? I never do. No. Not, not for this purpose, anyway. We just brought the computer to show the sort of flexibility of the uh, SPS 200, or the Ambisonic platform, rather. Yeah, yeah. Um, to sort of kind of add on to the idea of what I do on set, I think it's always based on workflow in the companies that you're working with, as Laura mentioned. Um, some of the companies that I work with have already a workflow established. They work with the same post guys and, you know, work with the same production guys. And we sort of already establish a report at, as to things that we can do on set to sort of kind of help them mm -hmm. uh, feed what they need. I, I love that uh, idea of t doing a diagram and, and sort of Absolutely. sketching it out for them. And, you know, for the most part, they won point sources. They want to be able to spatialize things themselves. Uh, they always love having an ambisonic microphone too, that's great, but they, I, I almost feel that point sources is really the main thing for them is that if they can spatialize the audio, they can do it even more convincing. You know, you cheat a little bit essentially. Yeah. Um, and there's no way to boom on these things. I mean, uh, well, yes and no. It huh. depends on the situation. Uh huh. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe this is a good point to show that picture that where you had that uh, boom microphone in plain sight. Oh, the along the stitch line. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you, do you, know, you see do you have the. That with the circle? Uh, no, it's the, the one, one. Top frame is with the microphone, bottom frame is stitched out. Oh, yes, yes. So you could probably talk yeah, better about so, this. So the top is just a picture I took of the setup. You can actually see the camera there uh, in front. And then the bottom is the final product after they've stitched it all together. Huh. So, yeah, so this was a, a stereo rig. Um, and so between the two cameras that you know, are seeing forward, there's a stitch line. So we were able to put that pole there and since the overlap in the cameras um, allowed for that. So you can see how in the final product it's not there. Um, and the two mics that kind of horizontally um, that we were able to just, they were able to paint that out since that ceiling didn't change in the frame since it was a static frame. So the same idea with you know, sort of green screen and replacing things, if the, if the frame is static, they can potentially paint things out. It is very costly and time consuming for them to paint stuff out. So that's why another good reason to talk to Post. What's their budget? Do they have the budget to paint it out? Do they have the sure. time to paint it out? Yeah. Um, those kinds of things are important. But also say you're doing a shoot where um, like you're shooting in a studio and there's no ceiling, they're gonna replace the ceiling in Post. So once you know that, 
So then you can, you know, potentially hang mics from the ceiling Got or it. boom mm -hmm. from the ceiling. So it just depends what the shoot is. If there are things they're planning to replace already, you can then take advantage of that. So it just depends. I think it's fascinating to me because it's such a new way of working in audio, where yeah. you're really sort of in the visual part of the, of the process. It's, it's um, yeah, it's, in, it's interesting. Um, do, do, do the cameras ever move? Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. Uh -huh. I think people are doing more and more with moving the camera now. Yeah. It depends on what you're trying to sell as an experience. So, uh, uh, one, one I remember of uh, that, you know, a friend of ours showed us is uh, the camera zip lining down. And so essentially you're, you know, you put the goggles on and you feel like wow. you're zip lining yourself. So that was a moving camera. Yeah. Um, so sometimes they move. Yeah, I mean, any rig you can put a regular camera on, you can potentially put a 360 camera on, huh. you know, and then just paint out Whatever the rig. rig. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. In Panama, we did a helicopter uh, thing where essentially the rig was outside of the helicopter, and so you get a whole, uh, you know, like a helicopter shot where you get the panoramics and everything, but now it's 360, you can pan around and everything, so. Wow. So they, they happen sometimes, but typically in 360 video, they're, they tend to be static, but it's definitely possible that they may move. Yeah, I think people are getting more and more uh, experimental with it. I think yeah. we'll see more and more moving shots. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I want to just make sure we got um, all the questions. Uh, I think, yes, Adam, um, I like your question. Uh, is there any, are there, for, before we get to Adam's question, are there any pictures that you guys want to show? We, we have a, a couple of them on Still Store. Yeah. Should we just go through a few Yeah, we can go through them, just talk, yeah. them, uh, yeah. talk about them a little bit and Good. why they're you know, relevant or whatever. What, what's the first one you guys want to talk about? Um, so here, why don't we show, uh, you can do Hamilton 360. Um, essentially this should be a picture of the camera rig, and this one is not with GoPros, this is with DSLRs, and the microphone positioned mm -hmm. yeah. there. Uh, so in this particular case, the microphone is above the camera rig. Sometimes, or a lot of times, it could be below. Um, but essentially that would be sort of kind of like a typical ambisonic, uh, 360 camera rig mm -hmm. setup is that you do want the microphone as close as possible to the camera rig to you know get that perspective in terms of ambisonic. And then I guess next we can show the sound field on the exterior shot in the field with the full wind protection on it. There. Ah, oh. Yeah. Uh -huh. So this would this would be um, this is also the sound field mic with a baby ball gag over it for wind protection. I hate that name. <laughs> uh, so in like in this shot, um, the character she was walking up to camera and she had a line. Um, but so for this, it's more for ambient. Sure. Um, and we weren't able to put it that close to camera because with the ball gag, it gets a bit bigger, harder to hide. So this is more towards the bottom of the the rig since they're going to paint out that all those monitors and the stand. With all this emphasis on ambient recording, is it? harder to keep the set quiet? I mean, do you have to keep it especially quiet? Um, or just normal quiet? Or? You, I mean, you always aim for as best as you can get. Um, I mean, she can speak to her experience, but in my experience, they're very open to making sure that we get what we need in production. <laughs> um, so they'll help us uh, make sure that things are quiet, you know, to whatever degree is possible. Um, any other? Uh, shots you want to show? Um, you can put it up through all of them. Yeah, if we could just, oh, well this one is interesting, I guess. Uh, this was literally last week, and this is Dominique from the French bakery in downtown, famous for the uh, cronuts. Uh, this is just like a third person rig. So, you know, typically 360 videos are first person, you know, you're the sort of kind of selling the experience. This one is like hanging out with Dominique and going through the market. And, and for this one, no ambisonic microphone, it was just literally miking uh, Dominique. Uh, and and that was pretty much it for that. So they can be very, very simple. Uh, that's just like another 360 rig with a SPS 200 uh, also on top. Um, and the, that's just like a different angle or at least you can see it better. So they're used a lot, I've seen a lot of 360 videos with like cooking and things like that. So that, that, that can also be a cool uh, way. 
there is a again SPS 200 with a camera rig, but below, and it's also in this particular case, it does have the VVG on, mm -hmm. and it's only because I think we were transitioning from outside to inside. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, I would have left it exposed or naked. Um, same thing with the bag at the bottom. So this is the nadir of the camera rig, and you can hide things there because usually either they paint them out or or do a nadir shot to sort of kind of stitch it together. Oh, same one. Same thing. And there are those GoPros, by the way. Yeah. yeah that's so so yeah, I mean I mean go, go back one, Jared, for me. Yeah, that's okay. This is like a traditional 360 mount. Uh, there is different kinds of 360 mounts, and they all achieve different. Uh, goals. Yeah. Uh, this one is sort of kind of like an all-seeing one, so it sees from every angle and you can just stitch things out. You, you'd have just like a little black hole in the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's other ones where the GoPros are sort of kind of vertical and straight. Mm -hmm. um, they're called broadcasters and essentially what they achieve is allow you to make composites because uh, you can shoot something and then just replace that particular shot from a different take if needed. Um, etc. So. But yeah, so you can see how, I mean, obviously depending which camera rig you're working with, yeah. you're going to be, you know, dealing with a different situation as far as stitch lines and places you can hide the mic and like this camera doesn't give you as many options. You Correct. can't hide it, you can't mount it right above, for uh -huh. example. So uh -huh. yeah, it's just you want to find out what camera rig they're using and that'll kind of help inform you know, what you and can do. It looks like a lot of different clamps and ways to plant things, yeah. more so than a traditional ENG shoot for sure. Yeah, for uh -huh. sure. Uh, this was from Lion King. I, I just thought it was a cool shot of a 360 <laughs> rig. <laughs> That's great. Uh, and you know, something like this happens and you're like, okay, well, what do I do? For this particular uh, a gig, we didn't do an ambisonic mic on the on the camera rig because it was going to be going up and down and things like that. So we just did a simple lavalier mic uh, that was omnidirectional to sort of kind of get a camera perspective thing. It was helpful, you know, if characters get close to the, the camera rig sure. and things like that. Yeah. Um, but still, it was point sources. For Lion King, there were, I want to say, 60 different uh, uh, microphones that the house provided for us. So we have a multi-track session um, and then, you know, in post, we do the spatialization of all those point sources mm -hmm. to achieve the, the you know, cool sound. Huh. This was an interesting uh, first uh, person perspective rig that I saw in California. It's from Radiant Images, and it's essentially a helmet that you wear and it has GoPro cameras like all around it. So for the, that particular shoot, we were doing uh, 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 stunts and like fighting, that type of thing, uh -huh. to record sort of kind of like one of the characters uh, fighting first person experience, if you will. And that's just a different 360 rigs utilizing different cameras that are in our GoPro. Um, and it's built into this like mobile uh, data and battery uh, uh, cart. And so that's an example where they would stitch that bottom, whatever that bottom yep. gack is from the camera's mm -hmm. perspective, wouldn't exist in the final product. Correct. Yeah. So this is interesting. So this is not a 360 shoot. This is a, a virtual reality shoot uh, where they do both uh, motion capture. So and and then let's yeah let's talk about the difference between VR and 360. So when I refer to VR, I use it as an umbrella term to indicate anything where you put a VR headset on. Mm -hmm. um, and that includes 360 videos because you know you would do that. But I do think there is a certain dichotomy or like a division between them. I think 360 pertains to being able to rotate in a 360 degree field, whereas VR, you're actually placed in an environment and you can actually walk. You can actually you know, touch things or like move into things. At that same Tribeca uh, festival that I saw, um, there was another VR piece that was entirely computer generated, but you were in the car, but instead of only being able to spin around on a single axis, if I wanted to look behind the seat of the car, I could just move my body and look behind right. the seat and wherever I wanted to look. Yeah. So with that particular photo, you could do that. Um, essentially, uh, that was Stephen Kellogg, who's a musician, a musician writer, composer. Hmm. Um, uh, he was uh, playing uh, a couple songs, and so, 
For that one, uh, in terms of audio, is close miking. So there's a mic by the uh, guitar mouth, and there is a mic uh, closer to him. Sure. Um, and so those are my point sources, if you will. And essentially, they can spatialize this in pulse very similar to a 360 shoot. But the difference is that they're doing green screenshot, motion capture, to sort of take his persona and be able to place it into any environment. Um, the idea is that you can do things where you know multiple users can wear VR headsets and be in the same space and sort of kind of interact with different things and that to me is sort of kind of the ultimate goal of what this platform would allow. Uh, very cool. I think um, in, I think we should end it there because we're, we're almost out of time. Sure. Um, is there anything that, that you guys want to add? Anything we haven't covered? Anything you want to communicate to the to the outside world? It's a very <laughs> open-ended question. Sure, very open-ended. Um, um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's different, but you know, don't necessarily be intimidated by it. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of similarities to traditional style filmmaking, but there's obviously things that you now have to take into consideration. Um, it's always about having a conversation with both uh, VR technicians on set and post-production and things like that. So that would be sort of kind of my takeaway from this style of shooting is that you should, if, if you didn't have before, you definitely want to keep an open conversation uh, with the people you're working with to deliver this product. Yeah, and I guess just thinking for post, you know, mm -hmm. try to free your mind up and think, what are the different actions that are happening? You know, how many things can I mic up? And, you know, how many things is going to be useful for post? Sure. You know, rather than just maybe a main conversation that's happening, you know, if you have someone ride by on a skateboard, maybe you want a mic on that skateboard so they can spatialize that guy riding by. Yeah. So it's really important to just kind of think how many different things can I mic up to have discrete sources? Are you still, is the golden rule still preserving dialogue or are, is, are you also going to go for effects that might overlap dialogue at the same time and just mic the effect, like the skateboard that you gave, as, as an example? Uh, I mean, I guess it depends on the project, mm -hmm. okay, you know, so. the needs of the project. Fascinating. Thank you guys so yeah. much for coming. Yeah, thank you for having yeah, us. Thank you. Um, will you stay with me while I talk about next week and yeah. other stuff? All right. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, so next time, Tuesday, June 21st, Zaxcom ZHD Wireless and SRX220. Slot receiver with Colleen Goodsir. Um, as always, you can reach out to us on Facebook and Twitter. Archives are at Vimeo and YouTube. And please send your ideas to info at gothamsound.com. Uh, thank you very, very much for tuning in. Um, send us ideas, send us questions. Have a good week, everybody.